Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time that we have to come and study your word again together. And though we're in lockdown, Lord, I'm so thankful for this internet connection. I pray that you would please preserve it so that we can have an effective time of study together today. Please guide us with your Holy Spirit. Speak to us through thy word, O Lord, and lead us into all truth that we might be transformed into your image this day. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of our sermon this morning is Balaam, Balak, and the Nicolaitans. We are continuing our study in the seven churches. Rain has just preached the first two churches. And now this morning, we are going to be looking at the third church found in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12. The Bible says this, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. So now we're looking at the church of Pergamos. And the word Pergamos, the name Pergamos means height or elevation. And it was in 323 AD that Constantine now declares the Roman Empire, the Roman nation, as a Christian nation. Of course, he had a fake conversion, so to speak. But now the persecution of the Christians during the, the Roman era, where they were thrown into the Colosseums and, and used as entertainment, now all of a sudden, Christianity is thrown into the limelight and more widely accepted. And overnight, it seems like persecution stops. And as a result, the Christian church, it relaxes its efforts and its watchfulness is also relaxed as well. But how is Jesus introduced here in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12? These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. Friends, what do we need a sword for? We need to use it to fight. And so in other words, God wants his people in this church to fight. But what does the sword represent in the Bible? Well, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of a heart. Did you see what it is? It is the word of God. Furthermore, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So God wants his people to fight with his word, with the Bible. Somehow they've not been fighting. They've stopped. They've relaxed. You know, in the church of Ephesus, we read this in Ch Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. This church, they could detect liars and false apostles. They knew their Bibles well. They were fighting in a sense. But then what happened in the next church? In Smyrna, in verse 10, it says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. That behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. People, they were going through suffering in the church of Smyrna. People were being attacked for the faith that they believed in. And so they held on. Their faith was strong. Their love and their devotion to God was strong. But now in Pergamos, the church has been elevated. The church has been exalted. And there seems to be peace and prosperity. It seems that everybody is okay with the Christian religion now. And they let their God down in this time of peace. And so they stopped fighting. They stopped going on the offense. And so Jesus says, I am that, am that sharp sword with two edges. I want you to fight. But let's continue. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days, where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. 
there's a few things that we have to look at here in this verse. First, where is Satan's seat? Where is Satan's seat? Well, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, we are told that the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. You see, Satan is known as a serpent. He's also known as the devil, and he's also known as a dragon. And it's interesting that in Revelation 13, verse 2, we see this beast. Look at it. This beast was like to a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth as the mouth of a lion. And what does it say? The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And if you have studied Revelation 13 before, this beast with seven heads and ten horns, we know this none other than to be the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. And where are they located? In Rome. And so Satan's seat was in Rome. And it says there in Revelation chapter 2 that there was people there that held fast the name of Jesus and that they did not deny their faith. You know, friends, to hold fast means you don't let go. Many people let go of the name of Jesus. They denied their faith. How? We saw it in the previous church. Persecution took place. And there are people that were weeded out of the church to some extent because they didn't want to endure the persecution. But now there's this relaxing atmosphere, this time of peace and prosperity, and it's easy to relax your watching and especially your faithfulness. But there's a group that's holding on. There's a group that is holding fast the faith. And there even was a man there. His name was called Antipas, who was faithful, faithful to the point of death. He was the first, or one of the first, probably, Christian martyrs. But you know, friends, what does the word Antipas mean? The word anti, against. Pus, father. So they were against the Father. Not the Father in heaven, but there was a group of people on the earth that was asking them to call them, uh, asking others to call them Father. And we know what religion that is, isn't it? But you see, we are told in Matthew 23 and verse 9, Call no man your Father upon the earth, for one is your Father which is in heaven. And who is that? Jesus Christ, uh, I mean, not Jesus Christ, the Father in heaven, of course, God our Father. And so what we're seeing is the characteristics of the papacy rising up already in the church of Pergamos. And yet, we still need to hold on. Why? What else is taking place in this church? Pay attention. Look at this. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of who? Balaam, and taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. There was in this church elements of people that we know from the Old Testament, Balaam and Balak. Well, friends, who is Balaam and Balak? Balaam was a false prophet. He was at once a good prophet of God. God spoke to him directly. And even as he was going into apostasy, God still spoke to him to try to save him. He is famously known for the man who spoke to a donkey. The donkey spoke to him and the amazing thing was he replied to a speaking donkey and didn't think twice about it, you see. He had a conversation with a dumb animal. Um, but, you know, he was at one, at one time a good prophet. God called him to an important work. But what happened to him? In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 15, the Bible tells us, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. What was the problem with Balaam? He loved money. He loved that desire for gain, not in God's way. Look, 
To say that no one loves money, I think we're all lying and cheating ourselves. It's not to say that we must love it at the expense of everything else, no. But we need money to survive, isn't it? But Balaam, he got to the point where he wanted the money so bad that he was willing to let go his hold of God. And many of us, we're like that nowadays. We chase after money at the expense of our faithfulness to God, at our calling that God called us to. Our, our, our eyes and our mind and our whole life is just saturated thinking about money, 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 and the gain of this world that we've let go our hold on God. And that is what happened with Balaam. But where does Balak come into the story? Well, you see, Balak, he was a pagan king, the king of Moab. And you can read about that in Numbers 22. But you see, Moab, they, they were a country and Israel was marching through and they got scared because they had, Israel had conquered other countries after they left Egypt on the way to Canaan. And so what did Balak do? He asked Balaam to come and curse the children of Israel and he promised large sums of money and gifts and rewards. And so Balaam, he got caught up with all these gifts and desire for gain, and he was willing to go and curse the children of Israel, but he couldn't. God said no. And even then, finally, God said, okay, you go, because you had set your heart to go anyways without asking my permission. And when he tried to curse the children of Israel three times, guess what? Three times he blessed them. And Balak got really upset. I called you to come and curse the children of Israel. Why did you now turn around and bless them instead? And so he told Balaam, you got to leave. I'm not going to give you any rewards or gifts or anything because you didn't do what you were meant to do. You didn't hold up your end of the bargain. And so Balaam, he left disappointed from King Balak. But on the way home, he turned around because he thought of a good idea. He understood, he knew, he told King Balak, ha, Balak how the children of Israel could be conquered, how they could bring the curse upon themselves without Balaam having to curse them himself. And so he got them, he taught Balak how to get the children of Israel to disobey God. You see, we're told in Numbers 25 verses 1 to 3, and Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, the Moabites, the king of Moab, right? And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow, their, bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. What happened? Balaam told Balak, you just get your Moabite woman to go in there and dance before them and get them to commit fornication. And guess what? God is going to be angry with them. God is going to break His covenant with them. And God Himself will curse them and plague them. And what happened? They committed fornication to the extent that they began to worship other gods and bow down and sacrificed food and ate to these gods. This was all from the advice of Balaam. How do we know this? Well, we read in Numbers 31, 16. Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. Baal Peor, remember, in Numbers 25? And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. And so seeing all this disobedience, what does God do? He plagues them. And look, the story has very profound significance and a very important lesson that we can learn from this. In Numbers 25, verses 6 through 9, look at what happens. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So this man, he was brave enough to bring a woman right in front of everybody. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman, her belly, 
And the plague was stayed from the children of Israel, and those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. Can you believe it? Eliezer, a priest, took a javelin in his hand and went and killed this couple, one a Jewish man, the other a Moabite or Midianitish woman. And on killing this couple as they were committing fornication, the plague from God stayed. And you know, friends, as workers in the vineyard, sometimes we have to do very tough things. It's not always a pleasant work, but if we are to stand up and vindicate the name of God and to, to, to stand up and be counted among those that are faithful and to really fight with the Word of God, there are some unpleasant things that we have to do sometimes. You know, I just read this morning about Moses and Aaron, how when Moses went up into Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, and he came back down and he, he saw what had happened. The children of Israel were worshipping a golden calf that Aaron, the high priest, had made for them. Moses got very angry. A moment, few moments before that, he was interceding for the children of Israel, but he was caught up with the sight of all that the children of Israel had done. And he got angry and he threw down the Ten Commandments in, in, in performing that act. He showed them that not only had they broken their covenant with God, but God had broken His covenant with them. But yet Aaron, he pretended to be meek and gentle, and he said, I don't know how this, the, this, this golden calf came out. I threw in the gold and out jumped this golden calf as if he had no part to play. And it seemed like the crowd looked at Aaron and he was meek and humble and gentle. And there was Moses on the other side. He seemed angry and, and, and they had lost all respect for him because of, of the tone of his voice and what he was doing. But verily, God was with Moses and not with Aaron. You know, friends, sometimes... It takes a person of strong character to stand up against the apostasy and the tide of evil that sweeps through our churches and what's happening in our communities and sometimes even in our homes. But friends, we have to be so careful to stand up and be counted. And that's exactly what Eliezer did. And it's very interesting when Eliezer killed this couple, a Jewish man and a Midianitish woman, where we recount later and we're given their names. You know, it continues in Numbers 25, verse 14. Look at this. Now the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. His name was what? Zimri. And the name of the Midianitish woman that was slain was Cosby the daughter of Zer, he was head over a people and of a chief house in Midian. What was the name of the man? His name was Zimri. And do you know what it means? It means my music. And then the woman that he got together with, the Midianitish woman, her name was Cosby, and her name means false or lie. And when you unite these two together in their fornication and what they did, you get false music. Friends, the union of this couple, their names together means false music. And I have no doubt that what was written here in Numbers 25 is a warning to all of us in the last days that music is going to play a very large role in the end times. To what extent? Well, these two were committing what? Fornication. Do you remember at the very beginning of the chapter, the Midianitish woman, the, the Moabite woman, they came in and danced before the children of Israel? Well, what do you think they needed in order to dance? They needed music. And as a result, that caused fornication. And you know what's very interesting, friends? In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8, the Bible says this, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her what? Fornication. Babylon at the end of time will cause everyone to commit spiritual 
fornication. And guess what will lead up to that? In Numbers 25, we're given this understanding. It's music. In Balaam's time, it was literal fornication. But in Revelation, we see spiritual fornication. And I believe that music has a large part to do with what will happen in the last days. What are people listening to? What are you listening to today? What is being played in the churches? You see, Pergamos has been elevated to a certain height. It's become widely accepted. The Christian religion has, but not because everyone all of a sudden became converted, but because the world invaded the church. Constantine declared his nation a Christian nation, and now Christians, well, pagans, flooded into the church, and there were false conversions everywhere. The world came into the church. And friends, today, we see in a big way how the world has come into the church through music as well. To some extent, some churches, there's no difference between a church and a rock concert. But we got to be so careful, friends. I'm not going to get into detail about all the music. I think there are many speakers out there where you can find about, you know, what's good music and what is bad music. But friends, just as a Christian should not be stealing or lying or killing, I believe that the Christian should not be listening to any worldly music, even during the week. We shouldn't just be Christians on the day that we get in our car and go to church on the Sabbath. You know, that was my life when I grew up. It wasn't, it didn't seem strange. I, I didn't really think twice about it, but it's because I was so engrossed in the world. But for the Christian, there should be a clear distinction about what is good music and what is bad music. And friends, we've got to be so careful because there is false music out there. And when we talk about false, they're not saying bad music, but false in a sense, music that is able to deceive, to make you do things that you wouldn't have ever thought you would have done, except the music began to affect your, the way you think and the way you feel, which is your character. God tells us today, hold fast to my name. Hold fast to my character. Don't deny my faith. And music has that ability to do that. We have to be so careful because there are elements in the world that are doing all that they can to make you leave your faith and your first love in Jesus Christ. We're told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Furthermore, in Revelation 2:25 but that which you have already, hold fast till I come. You know, friends, it's not enough that you were faithful yesterday or last week or last month or even last year, but are you still faithful today? It's not about being faithful just on the Sabbath and putting on a show. That's what you call a hypocrite. But are you faithful even during the week? It's not just about eating a certain way on the Sabbath and then eating whatever and however you want and can during the week. The only person you deceive is yourself. It's not about dressing modestly just on the Sabbath day to go to church, but are you dressing modestly and, and wearing the things that God wants you to wear and abstaining from the things that God wants you not to wear even during the week? Hold fast. Don't let go. And the only way to do that is you need the sword of the Spirit. You need the sword to fight against the wiles of the devil, the temptations that he throws your way to want to disobey God's word. We got to hold fast. Hold fast. But there's something else that's going on with this church as well. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. There are some people with, within the church that are holding on to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Instead of holding on to the truth, instead of holding on to the faith, instead of holding on to, to the name of Jesus, they hold on to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. 
And what's so interesting that we see in the church of Ephesus that we read about the Nicolaitans is this, Revelation 2 verse 6, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hated, or hate, pardon me. You see, the church of Ephesus, they hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. But their problem in church of Ephesus was not because they have an impure faith. It's they left their first love. They, they left their love for Jesus. And in doing so, they left their love for other people as well. They just became judgmental. But they were right. It's just they had no love for the people. They were trying to purge the church of all these people that were doing wrong, thinking that if we can just get rid of them, the Spirit of God can fall upon us. But friends, where's the love of God in your heart when you think that way? Right? We got to work for the salvation of every soul in the church that comes through those doors. It's not enough. It's not for us to say, hey, it's time for you to leave. Uh, you, you're just a bother. Don't come back to my church at all. No. we got to do our very best to reclaim not to judge. But what happened, you see, from Church of Ephesus all the way into the Church of Pergamos? Well, we read about it in Jude chapter 1 and verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, people crept in. They came in with different motives and intentions. They came in, in with, with the desire to corrupt the faith that God had given to the people. And instead of holding on to what had been taught, the faith of Jesus, they started to stray away and to listen and accept the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Friends, what is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Let's review this. I believe we looked at this in the Church of Ephesus. But in Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 957 Paragraph 6, we're told, Doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The doctrine is now largely taught that the gospel of Christ has made the law of God of no effect, that by believing we are released from the necessity of being doers of the word. But this is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Christ so unsparingly condemned. What is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? That all you have to do is believe. You don't have to keep the law. Or let's say it a different way, in our day and age, in what we see out there, all you have to do is love Jesus. All you have to do is accept His grace. And you don't need to keep the law. In fact, you don't need to keep talking about it. But you know what? You know what happens, right, friends? You know, the Christian world largely, we all agree you've got to keep nine out of the Ten Commandments. We, we believe that even though you, ne you don't need to keep the law, you should stop killing. You should stop committing adultery. You should honor your parents. You shouldn't steal. You shouldn't lie. You shouldn't cheat. You shouldn't covet. You shouldn't have any other gods before me. But you know what's happening? People are saying you don't need to keep the Sabbath anymore. And we have all sorts of reasons. It's out of date. Jesus got rid of it. We have so many reasons for that. Yet, we still believe in the other nine. And this was what was happening in the church of Pergamos. The Christians were being elevated. People relaxed their efforts and others began to creep in with their doctrines and corrupt the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Do we see that happening today? Oh yes. This is why in some degree, the, the, the poor churches are the ones that are more on fire and active for God because they are not relaxing their efforts. They come to church seeking for God because they need His help even throughout the week. But those that have prosperity, those that have riches, those that are comfortable, they relax their efforts. They don't care. They think that they're doing God a favor by turning up at church. Their mindset is very different. That's what happened with the Church of Pergamos, and that is what is happening with many of us today as well. What do we call this, friends? It's cheap grace. All you need to do is believe. All of a sudden, you can buy your way to heaven. All of a sudden, if you, if you sinned, all you need to do was just pay something. All of a sudden, all you need to do is just confess to a man and not to Jesus Christ, turning God's grace into filthiness. And this sort of grace, friends, has no power to change a person. 
change a life, turn a sinner into a saint, turn a drunkard into a sober person, turn a, a, a man who was a wife beater into a wife lover. This is the sort of gospel that we need, not this cheap grace gospel that accepts you just as you are and expects you that all you need to do is stay that way and you can be in heaven. But you know, friends, we got to be so careful in this sort of deception that is out there. Yeah, you may believe in justification and sanctification and you might think, oh, yes, yes, of course I believe in Jesus. That's the way we, that, that we are saved. We got to be so careful because any slight deviation from the truth, from the gospel, it pushes us down the path of the Nicolaitans. That's why we got to be watchful and on guard. This is why Jesus, he is represented as a sharp sword with two edges. In Romans chapter 16, verses 17 to 18, the Bible tells us this. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. We got to be on guard, friends. And in order to be able to detect those that are preaching the false gospel, the gospel that is contrary to the doctrine of Christ, we ourselves must be familiar with the truth. We must arm ourselves with the Word of God. We've got to continue to hold on. And not only do we do that once, but we've got to renew that effort every day. Backsliding is such, friends, it is subtle. It's small movements that we take away from Christ moment by moment or on a daily basis. And we separate ourselves slowly and imperceptibly until we are deceived ourselves. And then when we wake up, we realize that we are so far from Christ. And when you come to this next realization of holding on to the truth, friends, what do we have to do next? Let's come back to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 16. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Friends, what do we need to do? We got to repent. Repent from what? Repent from holding on to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Repent from, from having this false gospel and this cheap grace. Repent from the doctrine of Balaam and Balak, from all that turns us away from God and causes us to commit fornication with the world and get in bed with the world. We've got to stay away from that bad sort of music, friends. You've got to get rid of all that music collection in your home. If you're holding on to all this worldly music, friends, it's only sending you one path, and that's straight to hell. We've got to turn away from all of that. And you know the church of Ephesus, they were asked to repent as well. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5, we read, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. They needed to repent from leaving their first love. If not, God would come to them quickly as well. To do what? To remove their candlestick out of their place. You know, friends, if we don't repent, the Bible says God would come quickly and would fight against them, and probably us as well, with the sword of His mouth. You know, He's not going to use the Word of God when He comes. When God says He's going to come quickly, and fight against us with the sword of his mouth. Do you know what that's referring to? In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15, the Bible says this, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The sword that God will use at the end of time is not the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's what we have to use today. But what He will use is a heavenly sword. It's called the wrath of God, my friends. And unless we fight with the Word of God today, many people, and even our own souls also, will be lost. We've got to repent 
from our laziness of sharing the gospel. We've got to repent from our selfish lives because so many of us were caught up with our own lives. And we go throughout the week and we will look back and say, God, I haven't done anything bad this past week. I've not gone and lied or I, I, I didn't go and steal anybody's stuff. I've been honest, God. But many of us, we're not holding fast to our faith. We've gotten caught up with our own self-security, thinking, I, I lived a good life. So, so God, well, that was me, not you. So I don't need to study the Word of God as much as other people do. You've changed me. Not realizing that we are backsliding in other areas of our life. And God says, if you won't change and shake off the dust, the dust of the world, the specks of dust that mar our garments of righteousness. Yes, some of that has to do with our music that we listen to. And if we don't start fighting with the Word of God, many of us will be lost at the end of time. And at the end of it, God will hold us accountable because we knew the truth. We knew the truth, but we didn't do anything about it. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17, as we're coming to a close, friends, the Bible says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Friends, what do we have to overcome today? We have to overcome the doctrine of Balaam and Balak. We have to overcome the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. All that false doctrine, all that self-security to tell you, you can stay the way you are. Don't worry. God still loves you. All you need to do is believe and you'll be saved. You don't need to change your bad music. You don't need to change the way you dress. You don't need to change the way you eat. You don't need to keep the Sabbath holy. All you need to do is believe. Do you love God? Yes. Okay, you're all right. We've got to overcome that twisted thinking, friends, which the Bible does not teach. How? We've got to arm ourselves with the Word of God and fight. That's not the work of the pastor alone, friends. That's the work of every child of God. And if we overcome, the Bible says, we will receive hidden manna. You know what does hidden manna or manna represent in the Bible? It represents also the Word of God. It was the bread that was given to, from heaven to the children of Israel. It was, but this is hidden manna, hidden Word of God. It is the hidden secrets of the Word of God that is reserved for those that are overcoming, that are being faithful to share and to fight with the Word of God. It's the depth of experience that we all need to experience if we are to survive the famine of the Word of God that even now we are currently in. Do you know that it's in sharing that you're able to remember the Word of God more? As we learn to use the sword of the Spirit, we are strengthened. Our mind is quickened. It becomes sharp to discern spiritual things. And God can speak to us deep and hidden secrets that are not found at the surface of the Bible, not just for surface readers. And God will give us a depth of experience to overcome anything that Satan attempts to throw at us. But you know, friends, we will not be saved in indolence. We got to fight. We got to work. We got to share, and this is important for every child of God. I want to show you, in closing, two quotes. First is taken from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, 283, Paragraph 3. There are three watchwords in the Christian life, which must be heeded if we would not have Satan steal a march upon us. What are these three watchwords? Namely, watch, pray, work. Watch, pray, and work. Prayer and watching thereunto are necessary for advancement in the divine life. Never was there a time in your history more important than the present. Your only safety is to live like a watchman. Watch and pray always. 
Oh, what a preventive against yielding to temptation and falling into the snares of Satan. If we want to be victorious, we got to watch, we got to pray, but we got to work as well. And watching and praying is not enough. We got to work because this is what solidifies the things that we study, the things that we pray over. Coming to United Prayer, as I said, is not enough. You got to live out your prayers. When you pray for somebody, go call them, go talk to them, be a witness to them. Do your very best to work for their salvation and not expect God through His Holy Spirit to touch their hearts, to bring them to your door and to give you a call when you should have given them a call. And could it be that this is the reason why many of us are not seeing answers to our prayers because all we do is just watch and pray and we don't work. We've got to fight with the sword of the Spirit, friends. We've got to do something. But then also, we're told in Christian Service 107, paragraph 2, there is but one genuine cure for spiritual laziness. And that is what? Work. Working for souls who need your help. Friends, we got to work. We got to fight with the sword of the Spirit. All of us have to get involved in Bible study, in preaching, in sharing the Word of God. We got to get busy. It's not enough just to be faithful, coming to church and listen to a sermon once a week online and feel like your duty is all done. Friends, that is just the beginning. It is not the end of what God wants you to do. He wants you to fight. He wants you to take the sword of the Spirit that you might be able to cut away all the error and through all of that in some way, save some. He wants you to be a blessing today. He's always wanted you to be a blessing in this time of pandemic. You know, our Bible workers are not able to travel around much anymore. We were given Bible studies online. There's nothing wrong with that. Friends, if you told me that you're too busy, now online is available. You can give Bible study online. But you got to pray. you got to watch. you got to pray for the souls that need your help. you got to watch out for those that need your help. And then you got to go. And you got to work for them. Work for souls that need your help. The Church of Pergamos has gotten too relaxed in their efforts because of prosperity that multiplies in their homes and at their doors. And that has what happened. That has, this is what has happened to us today as well. We've gotten too comfortable in our own self-security. We've locked ourselves up in our own, own houses and our own condos and in our own rooms and no one can see what we're doing. But yes, 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 Pastor, I heard your sermon. Yes, yes, yes. I was there for United Prayer even though I didn't say a thing. Are you with me? We've got to go beyond just the watching and the praying. But we've got, got to get involved in the work itself. And so friends, today, seems like we can't do as much as we could before, but I'm telling you, we can do much more today because we can give Bible studies online. We have no more excuse. Now, we don't have to sit through traffic for one hour. Pastor, I can't do that. Now you don't have to. You just work your eight hours and just give one hour a week for Bible study to the Lord. Just one. Just one. Watch, pray, and work. I'm not asking you to work your way to heaven, friends. I'm asking you to work for the salvation of souls that in doing so, the, 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 the zeal in your heart and the truth that you read in your devotions can become real and, and stir the energies of your soul to be even more faithful to God. And so brothers and sisters, I want you to shake off the dust of laziness and deceptiveness, thinking that we will be saved in doing nothing and let's get busy for the gospel today god needs us the work will not be finished until we are aroused to do all that we can to finish the work in our generation let's not leave that work to the pastors 
and the Bible workers, let's take this responsibility upon ourselves today to do all that we can to hasten the second coming of Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, forgive us because we've just been so caught up with our own lives. All we think about, so many of us, is just money, our, our studies, our, our investments, wanting to retire, our, our home loans and our car loans and what we want to buy next. And Lord, we just got caught up with so much of self that we've forgotten that you're coming soon. We've forgotten even in this pandemic that the Bible tells us that all these pestilences would arise just before you come. Lord, we, we are getting hard in heart to the signs that you are showing us. Please, Lord, open our eyes today. Help us to stop living just for ourselves. Help us to see how we can get involved in the gospel ministry. And Lord, as much effort as we put into our studies and in our work and in our hobbies, help us to, to, put, to put just as much effort into the work of the gospel. Lord, set our hearts on fire with your love. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. For you're the one that gives us the motivation. You're the one that gives us the desire and the strength and the energy itself. And so fill us that truly Jesus can live in and through us today. Thank you for your pray in Jesus' name. Amen.